Welcome to the Real Estate Power Play Podcast, your launch pad for skyrocketing success in real estate investing. I'm your host, Gabe Rodarte, alongside Mark Monroe. We're ready to bring you transformative stories, groundbreaking strategies, and the insider secrets of real estate giants. Get ready to accelerate your investment journey and become a true power player in the world of real estate. Welcome to another episode of Real Estate Power Play. Uh, I am Mark Monroe, this week's host, and I am super excited to have Kevin on. And, uh, you know, we all, especially the way the economy has been shifting in the last few years, you know, affordable housing is really one of the directions where things are tend to going. And Kevin and his team over there at uh, Sunrise, they specialize in mobile home. Hey, Kevin, how you doing? Mark, I'm, I'm excited to be here, man. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Appreciate it. So why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself, kind of give everybody a little bit of a bit background on yourself. I know you guys been in this for quite some time and you mm -hmm. have uh, quite a few pads. You guys call them pads or doors? What do you guys call them? Uh, pads is, uh, yeah, is, is the way we reference it in our space. Yep. So that could mean doors, but not always. <laughs> <laughs> true. True. So when did you guys start? So you know, I, I guess uh, Sunrise Capital Investors, which is uh, my firm, I uh, founded it back in 2014. However, I've been a, a full-time real estate investor since uh, basically 2000. Uh, I got into it when I was, you know, got introduced when I was 19, bought my first rental property and investment when I was 20. I'm 45 today. And so I've been doing it for quite some time. I've And I've, you know, over the years, I've owned hundreds of single family homes. That was kind of how I, I cut my teeth, you know, uh, buying and building a rental portfolio of single family be before that was the cool thing to do. You know, that was very much just a fragmented, as you know, fragmented, you know, industry. Now it's very much getting consolidated with a lot of larger PE and institutional groups in the space, but that's how I got my start. And then really just evolved from there, Mark, you know, like a lot of these things do just always was looking for a, a more efficient way um, and a better way to scale and just you know, run a tighter ship and better operations. And you know, that's really, I started venturing into commercial real estate, different types. And I, um, over the years, I owned just about every type you could, you can imagine just really trying to figure out which, you know, which vehicle I felt was the best suited for us. Um, so I've owned still today, you know, industrial, uh, self-storage, medical office, uh, multifamily, uh, retail office, um, the list goes on and on. But, um, uh, and back in 2011, I got introduced by happenstance of mobile home parks. It was one of those asset classes that again, wasn't sexy, you know, and it wasn't institutionalized, wasn't in the mainstream. And honestly, it was one I had never considered. It wasn't part, part of like the major food groups of, uh, of commercial real estate. And, uh, and I just happened to meet a guy that, um, you know, had been in the space for a number of years and uh, just really, he piqued my interest uh, such a great deal over a two hour lunch that I left that lunch and basically committed myself to buy a mobile home park. And I did, it took me about a year to buy one uh, that was back in 2011. And uh, fast forward to today, we've We've uh, we've owned uh, and operated mobile home parks in 18 states. I think today we're in 13 states, and um, you know, northeast, southeast, and uh, some select midwestern states. And uh, we love the asset class. It's again, as you had mentioned, affordable housing is an incredibly high demand. And I, I do personally. This is not just me giving the sales advice. Right? I feel like mobile home parks truly probably are the best asset class to really fill that void. Um, and 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 we can go into detail as to why I feel that. Um, you know, uh, you know, it, it, later on the show here, but that's just a quick, quick background. So I've done just about everything, but uh, full-time real estate investor, I always joke and say, I never had a real job. So I'm, I'm, I'll still stand and be proud about that today. Wow. Wow. I wish, uh, you know, we say it's not a full-time job, but it, it, in yeah. a sense it is, but it does give us the flexibility though, of when to do things. And it really yeah. comes down to, and I'm sure you have an amazing team, the people on your team yes. help you where you're at, where you run everything. So, you know, um, let's dive in a little bit more you know let's talk about the affordable housing i totally agree with you 100 percent. i mean that's really you know the direction look where the rates are look at what the cost of since you know covid you know in the last couple of years with the housing it's a, it's a major major problem mm -hmm. and people are struggling so you know talk a little bit about like what you're seeing where you first got into in 2011 and where you're seeing it in today's world and today's environment yeah, I mean, I could speak only to I, I'll speak to your know, mobile home parks and what we've seen, you know, as far as the evolution. I mean, at the end of the day, an affordable housing product was needed back in 2011, just as much as it's needed today. I mean, obviously, the you know inflation has run rampant now over the past couple of years, and and things are just incredibly expensive, um, along with that housing, you know, as well. And so, you know, mobile home parks, you can kind of you can basically take. Um, I like to say it this way: you could take any one of our parks in any any state, any market within the country that we currently own. And 
I can promise you that it's the it's not the lowest quality housing option because I mean, we still buy in good school districts. We want to be on the right side of town. We want to buy a product that offers a you know clean, safe, and quiet um, housing option for our residents. You know, and so we put a lot of capital back into, and we've got amenities, things of that nature. But with that being said, take any community we have and com- and, and put it up against any uh, you know I guess comparative apartment complex. So if we've got like a B class community, put it up against any B class apartment complex or B class single family rental housing. And ours is going to be roughly 25 to 30% less. And so, and if you can't, if you're in that respect to market and you can't afford to live in one of our communities, then you can't afford to live there because it really is the cheapest housing option that exists in any respective market throughout the country. I mean, you're basically homeless at that time or living in a car. I'm, I don't, I, I don't jokingly say that. And so um, it's just a great asset class because you know, our communities provide a sense of, uh, of, of, of neighborhoods. Um, you know, we basically run them and op- operate them like a subdivision. Um, you know, we've got uh, amenities like playgrounds and some have swimming pools, some have pickleball courts. It just depends on the, you know, the community and, uh, who's living there, the demographic that we're serving. Um, but again, it's great product. Your mobile homes have come a long way. Just the mo- mobile homes themselves, the product themselves has come a long way since, you know, everyone's got a vision of what a mobile home is. And most of us probably think back maybe 20, 30 years, like metal boxes, metal roofs. I mean, these things are just like tin cans, right? And kind of haphazardly thrown together. And that's just not the case. They're they're built to a strict standard. Um, HUD oversees the the building uh, uh, process and ultimately puts their stamp of approval on it. And they're built in a controlled environment. And they're basically built nowadays with essentially the same material that a single family stick built home is actually built with. It's just done much more efficiently given that there's no weather delays or or you know challenges with subs, you know, coming on site and showing up on time. You've got these things built in a you know controlled environment in a warehouse. And typically from beginning to end, a, a standard size mobile home will be, you know, off the assembly line within three or four days. So it's pretty impressive. Wow. It has come a long ways. My first, yeah. like you said, you got into it and you did your first deal in 19. My first deal was at 19. And it was a mobile home. <laughs> okay. There you go. Yeah. yeah. I did the yeah. I did the old Carlton sheets, you know, the book. I went, and we, you know, got cardboard. Yep. We buy houses, put them up on a telephone pole, and I got in trouble. Didn't you know? I was nineteen. I didn't know any better. Mr. Power, enforcement. Go take yeah. those things down. <laughs> yeah, isn't that funny? That yeah. that man. That man. I I probably bought more single family homes during my career when I was buying single family from the damn bandit signs and any other method. I mean, we've done billboard, radio, TV, you know, but this is back before pay-per-click was really a big thing, but you know, all the other traditional marketing and, you know, guerrilla marketing methods, uh, but banded signs, they just used to kill it. And the uglier ones work the best, you know, the handwritten stuff tend to work better. <laughs> you know, they, they, they still technically do. You just got to be careful of the areas you put them up because municipalities yeah. nowadays really have a, an issue with it. Like Hollywood, Florida, I think now down there for every sign that's up, they're going to hit you with a $700 fine per sign. You know, it's oh just, my gosh. but yeah, they were somewhat strict like that here uh, in a few of the counties uh, on the west coast of Florida where we used to operate in. We just have to, you know, create, you know, you know, forwarding numbers and, you know, standalone kind of just shell a- you know, LLCs that own the number. I mean, like t- we tried to play the game and tried to avoid it. <laughs> but now, yes. Like you said, uh, PPC is so much easier nowadays. Yeah. And when you get to another level, it's just your whole marketing strategy just changes um, yeah. compared to when you first start out because, you know, you have a certain budget that you have to try to follow. So, you know, do you guys do you guys buy existing parks or do you develop yes. parks as well? You know, tell us a little bit because, you know, developing yeah. parks is kind of challenging depending on, you know, where it's at because a lot of municipalities, they don't want the parks because they're right. like, you know, the bad you know, reputation that they used to have back in the day. What are your thoughts there? Yeah, no, that that's, you, I mean, you hit a, you hit a valid point. In fact, that, that point, um, that supply demand imbalance that exists and, and, you know, no, there's really no new inventory, no new parks that are being built. In fact, there's, it's one of the asset classes that has a diminishing supply. So there's more parks that get shut down every year or get redeveloped into a, you know, higher, better use if they're in a d- desirable location where uh, maybe developers come in and going to put retail in or mixed use or something different, right? There's a, a much higher use for that, that piece of land. And so it's, it's one of the only asset classes that truly has a diminishing supply. And so it creates this weird supply demand imbalance to where there's more and more demand day by day for this asset class, but no new supply. And so we're all kind of fighting for the same things. And so with that, with that being said, we buy existing. Uh, we we um we find that you know in place cash flow and not having to deal with the, uh, you know the banging our head against the municipal wall for many years just to get a no over and over again is just not worth it. There's too much risk there, um, and so we buy existing. However, there's been many occasions where we'll expand an existing park. You know, we'll buy a hundred space park. 
um, might be able to acquire the uh, adjacent three acres of land, five acres of land, or maybe it came with it. And, um, and, and we've been very successful with expanding existing communities, maybe adding 30 spaces, 40 spaces, what have you, and, and, uh, and, and driving the revenue from that perspective, but building from the ground up, we have not gone that route. There's a few that do it. Um, it, it, it is a business model. It's just one that, you know, it's just, takes a lot it has a lot more frustration associated with it in my in my you know time equals risk in my eyes and there's a lot of additional time that goes into development and uh again knowing that a lot of municipalities just don't like it you know we always get lumped mobile parks tend to get lumped in that bad bucket again everyone's got this this um uh you know pr perspective of what a mobile home park is and what are the tracks and unfortunately that perspective typically consists of, you know, drug, sex, rock and roll, the bad element, the people that you don't want to live around, right? And that's just not the case. There are some like that, but there's also apartment complexes like that, single family subdivisions that are like that. And then you got the middle class and then you got the, you know, the white collar, white executive class neighborhoods. And we've got all that in the mobile home park space. But again, we get lumped in that bad bucket. So we don't go down that road, just uh, too much brain damage to do so. And so we buy existing. I like it. Yeah. I mean, there's some beautiful parks. I'm here in South Florida. I mean, yes, oh, absolutely. Kind of like you said, but I mean, some of these parks are just amazing. Of what they they. I mean, it's better than some of these neighborhoods you drive through. I yeah, mean, it's just absolutely keeping. You know. Yeah. No. I. I mean, absolutely. I mean, your 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 case in point. I mean, where you're based out of. I mean, there's some gorgeous communities, and 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 a lot of those probably aren't. I wouldn't even classify as affordable housing. You know. In fact. There's there's typically your standard mobile home park, which they come in different, you know, classifications as far as quality wise, like one star to five star, five star being the nicest. Um, and they all can kind of fall underneath that affordable housing umbrella. But then you've got what you see and what we see in Florida, Arizona. You've got some of these more lifestyle communities. They're not they're not really uh, they wouldn't get classified in the affordable bucket. They're expensive. You know, lot rents fifteen hundred bucks a month. Right. And then they've got ongoing HOA fees. They, but but they also have activities directors. They've got two swimming pools. They've got a bus that, you know, transport them to the mall back and forth and to activities. They've got shuffleboard. They've got all these things going. And so folks want to live there and be around other folks that are of similar age, but also enjoy similar activities that they do. I, I, I like that. So when you guys go into looking at um, acquiring an asset, you know, what's your strategy typically? Do you hold it for five, seven years? You know, you bring capital partners in. Is it more of like a syndication model? Tell us a little bit about when you find an asset, what you go through that process and then usually your exit. Yeah, no, that's a great question. And I would say it's been somewhat uh, um, a variety of, uh, of, of of business plans You know, throughout the years we've been buying parks. However, I will say that we always typically go in, and even more so today than maybe even when we start buying them a decade or so ago, knowing that this is diminishing supply and that literally we're all, you know, like... It, Sooner or later, and I'm not going to say it's just going to come to an end because there's always going to be opportunities. There's always going to be folks that mismanage properties and, you know, be opportunities for us to go in and buy and, and, and create value. But knowing that there's no new inventory really coming on the market, when we buy an asset, we go in with the mindset that if we buy an asset and it's in great location and we feel it's an irreplaceable location um, that's only going to get better over time, that we like the ability to hold that for as long as we would like. Um We've gone full cycle on many, many deals. I think 16 or 17 deals now over the past, you know, seven or eight years. Um, but really we go in to to be able to identify the best assets, but then really over a couple of years, you get to know the assets intimately. And then you you really you 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 tend to be able to determine which ones are the real winners, you know, out of your portfolio, cherry pick the ones that are like. I knew this was going to be good, but this thing's just knocked it out of the park, right? And so typically what we'll do is we'll sell the ones that are good, but maybe they just don't exceed, exceed expectations, right? Or they just haven't fully hit the mark for whatever reason. And then we'll keep the best ones of the batch, get full return of capital back, and then move on and do it again. And so we go full cycle and do recaps on what's necessary to get our return of capital back to our investors, and then like to hold the best ones of the batch for as long as we'd like to hold them. And, and you know, we like to tell our investors, 10 plus years and and not be forced or not be held to a, a time frame of when we have to sell. Because again, every time we sell, we've got to go through the challenging process of finding another one to replace it with. And if you already, you, you, you know, the ones you own better than anyone else, any new acquisition, they all got skeletons in the closet. Right. And so we like to somewhat limit those skeletons as much as possible. <laughs> and it's you like really it. keep what we have and, and, you know, do the cash out refinance over and over and over again. And uh, again, know that, know that our asset class has such a unique barrier to entry in that anywhere we buy, we truly don't have to worry about 
new competition or, or, you know, new supply opening up in the market. It just doesn't exist, which is interesting. Like it's, 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 it's a very different dynamic than any other asset class. We don't have to worry about yes. that. Yeah. Especially, I mean, I've been following the storage space. You know, I got into a couple of deals, but every time we turn around, there's another one popping up and it's starting. I feel that's going to become a little bit oversaturated in certain markets. You're actually, it has already. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. 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 And, and again, in due time, that inventory will get absorbed, but it's really hard for the small investors, right? Like th that have, you know, uh, carrying costs that they did not, they didn't, they didn't pr put that in the pro forma, right? They, th they didn't underwrite that risk, maybe not enough, right? And it becomes very ex expensive and ultimately could, could get to a point to where either they basically did that deal for nothing. No one makes money or potentially even lose money. So it's, um, yeah. And I, I think we find ourselves there. I mean, I, again, I think every other asset class has that risk. Self-storage is, is definitely one that's already felt some pain in different markets, multifamily and certain sub markets as well as felt that same pain with just new, new product coming along. Like Phoenix, Phoenix tends to go through these ebbs and flows all the time. Phoenix right now and a number of the sub markets of Phoenix, I've got some projects I'm personally involved in. Um, and, and they have, there's a lot of new inventory that had been under uh, construction in the last couple of years. And it's being delivered now, a lot of it. Um, and it's going to take time for that to get fully absorbed into that marketplace. And so, you know, who's got the holding power? That's really what it comes down to. Time typically heals all wounds in real estate. But do you have the money to buy yourself the time necessary is the question. It's true. It's true. I'm, I'm starting to see it here. Well, actually, I've been seeing it for the last year, year and a half, two years. You know, we're here in Florida, especially when you take the 95 corridor going from, you know, West Palm Beach up through Jacksonville, all the inventory that you see coming online there in the multifamily world space. And I guess a lot of it's going to be become build to rent model over in that market. So and mm. that's not even cheap for affordable housing now. You know, people no. trying to go into that, you know. So but you can't, you know, the cost of construction is so high and just the land basis is so high. You truly can't build what most folks would classify as affordable housing. You can't, you can't build it unless, unless you get grants or unless you get some type of other um, subsidies from a government entity. Like you, you, you truly, it's not cost effective to build affordable housing again to what would get classified as an affordable monthly or annual payment. It's just, it's not possible. It's nearly impossible to do. So it's no, I totally, I, I 100%. So, and it's interesting, you know, we're, you know, a few weeks here, we're going to be a new leader supposed to be coming in the office. It's like, mm -hmm. how do we, you know, as investors in the real estate game, how do we position ourselves and how do we look at that? You know, you've been in this a long time. A lot of people are still new coming into this in the last few years, you know, since the whole social media and the gurus out there jumping in here and trying to promote all this stuff. So it's kind of, do you, do you look at that a little bit? Like how are you going to position yourself with whoever's running in the political environment world? Yeah. I mean, to, to a certain degree. And I'd say that, um, a lot of that, at least when we look at stuff like, and we tend to stay away from blue states anyway, but like we, you know, like that, that, that just becomes, becomes a bigger emphasis for us. Like, like regulatory changes that, that might get some legs in, in certain states, you know, depending on what happens uh, in the Oval Office, right? Like you, who's going to be in there pushing what, um, but, but generally speaking, not, not a lot, because at the end of the day, uh, and I think this, this, this tends to hold true, whether it's good times or bad or whatever part of the economy or economic cycle we're in is that the fundamentals, again, whatever your business model is, if you've got it down packed, you understand your business, like the fundamentals don't really change. They haven't changed. Uh, I mean, interest rates have changed, uh, but at that just means that I'm not, we're not buying, we, we haven't been able to buy as much, right? We can't, we're not getting deals to pencil, but the fundamentals haven't changed. I could, I could, you know, artificially uh, have them make sense on a, on a Excel document or a, on a pro forma. But again, if we're, if we're willing to be honest with ourselves and, and, you know, hold true and be disciplined, the fundamentals haven't changed. So we just kind of stick with what we do and what we know what's worked for us for many, many years and just keep, keep rolling with it. So um, I would say that very few discussions truly revolve around, you know, who ends up making it in an office. Most of it is, you know, let's just continue to stay away from that state or that region, you know, because they've already got some, regulatory chatter happening and uh you know if it if it if we truly go you know blue then that's going to get probably some additional legs of support and we just don't want to be there you know we've actually owned in other we've owned in states where rent control like we owned in new york for many years um had some great assets there beautiful assets and we actually owned them when statewide rent control came in to play there and it was horrific you know we ended up doing well because we owned them for many years we had a low basis um but like that literally is an albatross for anyone that owns there. It's three percent annually. It's crazy. You can't even keep up with the capital needs that are necessary for a property, like ongoing improvements or big capex items, 
when you can only increase it three percent a year. You got to replace roads or infrastructure, water lines, sewer lines. There's no way to actually ever recoup that money from a landlord's perspective. And so you're going to see properties that just can you know continually degrade over time. They're just going to go in a downward spiral and capital's not going to be infused back into them. So I know I, I got off the rails there a little bit with your question, but generally speaking, no, we just stick to the fundamentals and stay disciplined with, with, with what we do. No, I, th I think that's uh, what you're stating is important, especially people that are investing in some of these states, you know, especially new investors coming in. They, they don't know what they don't know. And, you know, I like you, I have some property up in um, some in New England. It's a blue state. And, you know, my 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 contract used to be forty five dollars an hour. Now is at seventy five dollars an hour. We have to pass that cost on. But they're yeah. like, oh, you know what? The landlords are the ones that's you know, getting the rich off of this, but it's, in fact, it's not, it's just, you know, it's basic economics, you know, it's what our expenses occur, we have to pass that on. Otherwise, nobody's going to be living in property. We're all going to get foreclosed on and, or yeah. it's going to be really run down. So, you know, how, uh, how are the rates affecting you guys? Are you just been, how are you guys underwriting? You know, what kind of issues do you see happening yeah. that you see, or are you being a little bit creative, a little bit more in some of your deals that you're acquiring now because of the rates? You know, I would say, you know, last year was a phenomenal year for us. Um, it was literally the, we did about a hundred million dollars of acquisitions last year when a lot of other folks weren't buying. And the reason is I've, I've been through this before I went through 08, lost pretty much my entire business. It was, you know, just a challenging time. I'll leave it at that. Um, and so I didn't want to do it a second time over again. And I didn't feel like I was, I feel like I was a fairly conservative investor back then. So we just become, you know, I, I, I kind of lead the ship over here at sunrise. And so I just, I don't want to go through it again. Uh, I don't, I don't want to, I, I didn't want to ever, you know, do deals that I couldn't honestly, you know, tell myself this makes sense or, you know, put my own capital and investors capital into it and feel good at night and sleep at night that this deal makes sense. And so we didn't buy a lot in 2020, 2021, 22. In fact, we sold quite a bit. Uh, we kind of took advantage of peak pricing and, and sold assets if you know if we got unsolicited offers and I couldn't make any sense of the offer whatsoever and knowing the asset better than the person that's buying it, we unloaded a lot. And so I think that just put us in a really good position come last year when again rates jumped up, everyone's on the sidelines, people are running damage control, people are just you know dealing with floaters or debt maturities. It put us in a position to be able to take advantage of not distressed properties, but there was a number of distressed situations, distressed partnerships, debt maturities that were coming up and we, we were able to take advantage of it. So we haven't changed our underwriting. Um, I wouldn't say we've even had to get more creative with the financing. It's just opportunities present themselves. And we were, you know, one of the few maybe in our industry that that were actively buying and had the capital to do so and the confidence from our investors to keep keep moving forward. So um no, we underwrite a lot of deals, Mark. I mean, we 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 look at a ton of stuff and um we make a lot of offers and I'd say I guess I wish I know we tracked this soon. I don't have any of the data points, but we, you know, it's probably like one deal truly gets like, you know, we underwrite truly underwrite a hundred out of that hundred that we fully go through a, a model on, do a full model on, probably only making offers on like 60 of them, like actually writing an LOI on it. And of those 60, maybe we'll get one or two accepted, something along those lines. So we do, a, we look at a lot of stuff and a lot of it just doesn't make sense. A lot of it also is circled back around. Um, in the uh, the in fact, one of the deals truly was a deal that we we um we tried to buy it. Uh, it's interesting because so we tried to buy it. It was an institutional owner tried to buy it. It came to market in 2022, um, and we were second in line and we got outbid. Uh, it ended up some selling for uh, 20, 20, I think 28.9 million is what it was under contract for. And we got a call October of 2022 um, from the uh, from the broker. Or oh, wait, is that 23? uh yeah tw uh end of 22 um in october 22 that you know it's come, came back around uh guy couldn't close on it and we ended up closing on it last year um july by it took july to get there um we ended up closing on it for 15.4 million dollars um it was an institution it was owned by invesco but it was a debt maturity and uh they were forced to sell it not in a great time and it's it is a performing asset phenomenal asset um and so, again, a lot of other folks weren't in line to do that. We had to close the cash and close it quickly, and uh, we were able to perform and execute on it. So um, I don't remember your original question, Mark, but uh, I guess bottom line is our fundamentals haven't changed. And uh, um, we've continued buying and, 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 and feel as though like this year is going to turn out to be a great year for us as well, just uh, picking up some great opportunities when there's just less competition. Um, you know, we're never the highest bidder ever. And, and so when things were on a fire, we were getting out, but we would never get offers accepted. We just, we, we just, we weren't being chosen because we weren't aggressive with our, we weren't putting money hard up front. 
you know, uh, from day one, which became the case. I know multifamily, you're very familiar with, you know, that whole game. And we just never participated in that. And I'm kind of glad that that we did, did, didn't get caught up in that frenzy because we're in a good position today because of it. And no, um, actually, I was just going through some of my data and I was just explaining with the team that, like you said, 70% of my deals come from follow-up where they originally don't accept the offer that we originally put out there. They come back around six months, year, two years later. It's just constantly following up and making sure you have good systems in place on that stuff. So, yep. but you know, a lot of times these guys, you know, they just want an asset so bad they jump into a deal. I'm like, this still doesn't make sense, especially the Airbnb world. Oh my God, that, that whole mess. <laughs> they, you know, it's oversaturated, all the regulations coming into place and these guys, oh, you know what? Airbnb is the way to go. And we all seen that wave and we see what's happening there. So, um, what about when you guys acquire, when you guys acquire an asset, a lot of times these are park owned homes, you know, um, I, I just, I was involved in a deal not too long ago in South Carolina and there was uh, 108 pads and 58 of them were park owned homes. What do you guys normally do on something like that? Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, number one, we won't underwrite the the park owned home income. We'll just put like a shell value on the actual physical mobile home itself and and you know make that determination of what we're going to pay for that piece of the deal um, by what the value of the shell of that home is. And we'll only underwrite the actual lot income. Because I found that over the years that if you're really honest with yourself as well, especially if you're talking about used mobile homes, if you run them like rentals, there really isn't that much profitability above that lot rent. You know, if, if, you know, if you turn it, you know, every 12 to 18 months, you got to go in and do paint and carpet or flooring and, you know, some minor repair, have a, a, a you know month downtime, all that, all that income or that profit that you thought you had uh, is, is gone. And so really the lot rent is where we make our money. And so, you know, we've got uh, his, historically, we would really uh, try to shy away from communities that had a large park on home contingent. I would say that, you know, anything more than like 10 or 15%, we just would kind of, we'd, we'd pass on. Number one is that financing used to be very difficult, you know, like getting agency, agency loans on parks that had a lot of park on homes. It's not really doable. They'll do it now, but they still have some kind of thresholds where if it has more than 25% park on homes, you can't get a Fannie or Freddie loan on it. Um, so at that point, you got to go to like a bank and which has, you know, higher rates and re full recourse versus non-recourse. And we like to know whatever we buy. We want to know that even if it doesn't fit Fannie or Freddie today, we want to know that there's a clear path to get there. And the only reason typically if we buy something today, why it wouldn't fit in Fannie, fit in Fannie or Freddie's um, uh, parameters is because it has too many park on homes. So normally what we do, um, and we're doing it right now, we've got a pretty big, two, two large communities in Columbus, Ohio, great, gorgeous communities. Um, the guy infilled a lot of newer homes over the last 10 years. Uh, and we bought it. It was three hundred and I think three hundred twenty-three sites. Two hundred two of them were park-owned homes, all later vintage, though, like nice homes, like nice quality homes. Um, and uh, um, we went with a uh, a local bank that we've used many times over and over again. But we've got a clear path. It's a five-year loan. We've got a clear path. We know we can accomplish it in three to where we're going to, I think we have to convert a total of, I think it was about roughly 80 of them, 80 or 85 of these homes um, over the next three years, convert them into home sales. And so we have an internal, you know, we have a couple of lenders we work with and we have a whole system in place. So we're, we're going to convert these as they turn, as these rentals turn, we'll convert them into home sales and get to the point to where we can put a agency loan in place down the road. But we'll, we'll, we won't stop that conversion program because again, in our, in our opinion, number one, you keep your expenses down, the less park on homes you have, but also number two, you get a sticky, a stickier resident base, you know, renters are renters. And I'm not saying that some renters don't stick around for many, many years, but you know, kind of the average is probably 12 to 18 months, you know, you know, if you look at it and then you've got that downtime, you don't you never, you never get the sense of community. You don't get, you know, renters typically don't put money back into their units. They're not going to put flowers in their front yard. They don't take that sense of, uh, you know, home ownership pride. Um, and so we really like to get it converted to a homeowner model. Um, so that number one, they take pride of ownership, and, but really number two, is that they become stickier. We've got residents in some of our communities that have been there for more than 50 years. And then they've got other relatives that live in the same community. It's just like a, a neighborhood, a subdivision, right? And like, they're not going anywhere anytime soon. And they pass it down to their kids or sell it to their children. And it's just, for us, that's a better long-term business model than the straight rental model. And I know folks that do the rental and they do great with it, but I'm looking for that longer, stickier resident to stay there for for many, many decades. I I... I see. Yeah, I was looking at some of them, and the re on this particular one that we're looking at, seventy percent of their expenses is through the rental. So yeah. they're in that process, like you said, they're just kind of convert, trying to sell them through like a seller financing back to the people living in the property, 
you know, to try to get rid of those expenses. Um, yeah, and I, and I found that like in that, in that model real quick, you know, and I, what I also found is like if they're older homes and they've been rentals for a long time, they're using abuse. A lot of these park owners are just mom and pops. They don't infuse the right kind of capital back into these things. And so these things just just get beat up and, and you know, um, just cobbled back together, you know, repairs not done correctly, half ass repairs. And so I found that trying to convert really old homes like that, you know, it's like a 50, 50 shot. Like you might find the guy that's renting and he's like, man, I'd love just to own this thing. Right. You, you want to eliminate the burden from you, let them take over the ownership of it. You just want your lot rent. And that way you get rid of that repairs and maintenance line item. But I found that if the home is old, like really old like that, at some point when a big repair comes up, cause it will, they're not going to be able to afford it. They're not going to pay for it. And they're just going to abandon that home. And literally you're going to get it back anyway. <laughs> it's going to end up That's back true. in your pool and um, you're going to have to fix it or decide on what you're going to do with it. And so um, it's, it's, it's an interesting business, um, but we, 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 we scrutinize heavily parks that have a park owned home component, especially if they're older homes. Uh, it's good. Yeah. Yeah, anyway, so we'll leave it at that. No, I, I like that. So um, let's kind of shift a little bit, if you don't mind, yeah. like, when you're looking at a deal or you're looking at bringing passive investors in, you know, um, accredited investors or whatnot, do you have a certain guideline that you're looking for to provide to them in the returns? Yeah, yeah, we do. Uh, and, and we and we work with accredited investors. Uh, we operate under Reg D506 uh, Cs. And, um, you know, and it's and it's changed. Uh, you know, even even our waterfall has changed over the last couple of funds. We we typically do a fund structure, so we don't do in, in individual deal syndications. We do fund structures. We just launched our fourth fund, um, this past October, October of 2023, and uh, and are currently buying a net now. We've I think we've raised about 42 million in our current fund and uh, have acquired about 120 million of assets. Um, but you know our projection this uh, particular fund um, is 14 to 16 percent IRR over a uh, seven year span. Um, you know our objective is to get a full return of capital back to our investors within that five to seven year span. I think as it sits today it's going to be closer to seven years unless things really take a change in the opposite direction with rates and, and, you know, the ability for us to go recap deals once we're done executing the business plan. Um, that's really what we're shooting for. Um, you know, we've got even the, the, the you know, the, 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 the pref classes have changed over the years. Whereas, you know, uh, two funds ago we were, you know, it was a six pref. Um, and, and there was, you know, there was one class. Um, now we've got three classes based on how much capital is uh, is invested in the deal, and so it goes anywhere on the low end from an eight eight pref to uh, to the high end of a ten pref, right? And so, and then we even have some some special one off classes that we've created for just offering some incentives on some some bigger capital raises that we've needed here over the past four or five months. So, um, dramatic difference from what it was uh, just only a couple of years ago, but. Um, we, we, we like, we've done full cycle. We've done a full return of capital in our first two funds. The uh, first fund, it took us about 30 months to get a full return of capital. We still own assets in that fund. The second one, um, took just under four years to get a full return of capital, still own a couple assets in that fund. Kind of cherry pick the best ones, have a really low basis, have agency debt on them, kind of just, you know, right. Letting them right off into the sunset with cash flow. Um, our third fund, which, um, we closed out last August, um, we're still, about half of the business plans complete on the on the communities that are in there. The other half is at the tail end. However, you know the recap events. I just don't know when they're going to happen yet. You know, we don't have any loans that are coming due anytime soon, um, and we're just kind of waiting to see what's going to happen with rates. And uh, we won't be able to start doing a full return of capital on that one until we can start refinancing properties. And there's a number of them that are ripe for the refinance, but we just don't want to jump the gun and and put some what I feel would be inferior debt at inferior rates, uh, you know, in the event that they start going down here over the next year or two. That's some great stuff. So no, it's really good. We're about to wrap it up here. Um, is there, Kevin, is there a question that I didn't ask you that I probably should have asked you that you think would be good for the users or listeners? Yeah, yeah no, it's, it's, it's a great question. I mean, I think, um, I think in today's world, I think there's a lot of, uh, I, I guess it depending on who, who I'm speaking to, but I mean, if uh, may, maybe you're a passive investor or someone looking to put capital with, with other operators, I, you know, there's been a lot of shakeup over the last couple of years. And again, I, back to my original point, the fundamentals of the business or just of how things work haven't really changed. Uh, you know? And so I think that, you know, if you're looking to, to make a decision to invest capital with, with another operator, really it's, and you should have done this thing, this same thing should have been done many years ago is that you've really got to scrutinize the operator, you, who the, who the sponsor is, spend the most time doing the due diligence on that. 
and spend the least amount of time, you know, getting all googly eyed over, you know, these OMs that get pushed out with, you know, uh, just seem to be too good to be true returns and beautiful marketing packages and things like that. And spend the most time and money and resources on actually doing due diligence on the, on the team that's going to be running it. Right. It's like kind of the jockey, you know, the jockey that's going to be racing the horse. And, um, and I think that that's, I, I think a lot of us, um, just, we neglected to do that over the last couple of years. And I think a lot of folks are now coming to realize that maybe they've, they might lose some money or they have lost some money or really it just, they didn't, they didn't hit you up with the right jockey. You know, they, they, they chose the wrong one. Um, so that's, that's probably a, a point I would like to make. I mean, I think that's just so important. You know, I want, I want to make sure that everyone makes the right decisions, right. That it could take so much time and effort to make the money that we've made. Right. And we want to invest it wisely and have it compound and grow for us. And so that we can, you know, in turn live the lifestyle that we choose, pass it on the family, you know, create a legacy for our children and our families. Um, but you can only do that if you make the right decisions uh, up front. I mean, that's a great, great point. I mean, for the last 10 years prior to that, especially in the mobile uh, multifamily space, you know, even if the operator screws up, the the rates were so low enough, they could, yeah. the mistakes, but now you're really starting to see when there's a screw up, you're actually seeing the results from it now. And we are, and that's why it's really, yeah. really key to kind of, find a great operator that really knows what they're doing, you know, especially if you're putting a capital to work. So Kevin, I can't, you know, thanks so much for coming out. How, how can people reach out to you if they want to know a little bit more about you and yeah. how, how to speak to your firm? Yeah, sure thing. Uh, so if you want to come learn what we're doing at sunrise, you can go to invest with sunrise.com. Uh, there you can see our most, you know, current offering. We also have a lot of, you know, additional resources and details on the site. There's some, you know, white pages that we've, that we've written on, not just mobile home park investments. We also own parking, which we didn't talk about here today, but those are our two investment verticals. Um, but also we, we, we're pretty transparent, like deals that we own that we're acquiring, you know, we put up third-party reports like appraisals and, you know, phase ones and, um, you know, PCA reports and things of that nature, just to, you know, give full transparency of not just what we're buying, what it is, you know, what third parties have said it it's worth today, but then also our business plans. And then we even include things that we've gone full cycle on kind of the original business plan, how it ended up, you know, challenges along the way. And so there's just, there's some good reading there, some good resources that you can, uh, they can take advantage of. And then outside of that, Mark, um, kevinbup.com is my personal site. I also host my um, commercial real estate investing podcast on there. It's called real estate investing for cash flow. Um, but e through either one of those sites, you can track me down. And then I've got a pretty unique last name. And so if you go anywhere on social media and just type in my name, you shouldn't have a hard time finding me. Right. Kevin, I really appreciate it. Thank you guys so much. Uh, thank you guys all for listening to another episode of real estate power play. If you like what you hear, like, share, and uh, just reach out if you want anything to know a little bit more about Kevin. We'll also put his information in some links below. Uh, so wherever you're listening to this or watching this, you'll be able to find Kevin's information. Thank you guys all so much, and we will talk to you guys soon. Be well.